Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. If you're looking for a gift for a woman in your life or for something for yourself, I do encourage you to check out my wife's business, Ashira Clips, and that is over at Lila Rose, L-I-L-L-A Rose dot biz slash Ashira, A-S-H-I-R-A. And you can also check out her page, which has uh, videos and uh, pictures over at ashira.greatdetectives.net for Facebook. But now it's time for today's episode of Mystery is My Hobby. And uh, this one is entitled Snowbound. And let's go ahead and take a listen. Mystery is my hobby. There had been a murder in the small country town of Menden. According to the newspaper accounts, the man who was at first believed to be guilty of the crime was allowed to go free. But no satisfactory reason was given. I reread the published stories and learned that on the evening of February 26th, a farmer named Walt Centrell was late for his supper. That you, Walt? Yep, it's me. Well, set the milk down in the shed and come into your supper. Been on the table more than an hour. Walt? All right, all right, I'm a coming. Can't give a man time to wash his hands. Wash his hands. Land's sakes, he's had time to take a whole bath, let alone wash his hands. Oh, the way you nag, Marthy's enough to set a man's nerves on edge. The way I nag. Uh. Well, my sense is, Walt Santrell. You've been out in that there barn long enough to milk 40 cows instead of just two. Now sit down and eat your supper. Who said I've been milking all the time? Agnes is sick. Man just can't sit around and let one of his critters suffer. Well, it seems to me you haven't been doing much to help her. How much milk was there? Seven quarts. Seven quarts. Mm. My land. Walt, the thing to do is either call in Duck Halliday or get rid of Agnes. Now, we can't afford... Listen, listen. Sounds like Ed's drunk again. No! Oh, they're at it again. How she does put up with him, I don't know. Such neighbors. I declare, if I were Marion Blake, I'd do something about that there husband of hers. I declare I would. Any husband who beats his wife ought to be put away. Oh, it's harmless. He's just a drunken, no good bum. Oh, uh, listen to that, Martha. Yeah, I'm a listening. My senses, I've been a listening ever since Ed Blake brought that new wife of his into Menden a year ago. And every time I boil inside, Walt. We ought to do something. No, it's none of our business. What can we do? We can report to Constable Finn McNutt. That's what we can do. Yeah, we did that once, and what good did it do? Well, it did plenty of good. Finn talked to Ed, didn't he? Finn told him if it happened again, he'd take steps now, didn't he? Uh, steps? Martha, you don't know about them things. But unless Martha Marion registers a complaint, taking steps won't do no good. Well, then I think that we... Oh. Walt Santrell, I'm going over there. I'm certainly not going to sit here and listen to that. Why, he'll you kill the still. poor... It's none of your business. You keep your nose where it belongs. I won't. I don't care if I don't know her very well. I'm a woman, and she's a woman, and it's my duty. You duper. sit still, I say. For all you know, she likes being beat up by her man. Some women are like that, to tell me. Oh, if you could have seen that there little mite of a thing this morning, you wouldn't be talking such nonsense. Seen her this morning? Did you see her? I most certainly did. She come a-calling. Said she wanted to borrow some flour. But that was only an excuse. She knew it and I knew it. What she wanted to do was to talk. What'd she talk about? Uh, what do you think she talked about? She talked about her husband, of course. Uh. He's drunk more than half the time, she said. And when she tries to reason with him, he hits her. Oh, it's terrible. And she doesn't know what to do. She's scared half to death, the poor little mite. Well, that settles it. I'm going over there. And if you're not man enough to come with me, Walt Santrell, you can just stay Now, here. wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get your dander up. I'll go along with you. Well, come along, then. My lads, I've had all of this I can stand. 
Archie, this ain't none of our business. I'm making it my business. Go back home if you want to, Walt Santel. I'm going to see you. All right, all right. You talk too much. Ah, they're not here. Now, the best thing we can do is go along home and forget the whole business. Not me. I started this thing, and I'm going through with it. Uh, there. See? The door is open. That means they're home, don't it? Well, why should it? Nobody in Menden ever locks the doors. You're just using that as an excuse. Oh, stop being so logical and keep quiet. Mrs. Blake? Oh, Mrs. Blake? Uh, there's no one here now? Now, be still. Where are you going? Out into the kitchen, of course. That's where the sounds come from, didn't they? Where else would I look? Look? Look for what? <gasps> My goodness. Oh, Walt. What's the matter? What are you staring at? It's her. Uh, it's oh. poor Mrs. Blake. Look at her lying there on the floor. He's knocked her unconscious. Oh, I knew he would. The brute. Well, well the stop brute. your jabbering and do something. What shall I do? What can we do? Get some water from the sink <laughs> and a towel. Good heavens, woman, stop your blood. Oh, blubbering. that brute. That brute. That poor little creature. Knocked out cold. Wonder what happened. I'll get some ammonia. Just plain water. Walt, what's the matter? We won't be needing ammonia, Marthy, or anything else. She's dead. Bart, tell me just one thing. Are we up here to investigate a murder, or are we just out for the ride? Well, let's say we're riding out to investigate a murder, Inspector. Now, that's what I call a smart comeback. Yes, <laughs> sir. That's a dilly. Ha, ha, ha. Inspector, there used to be a day when you had a sense of humor. What happened to it? I've still got it. Just say something funny. Hmm? All right. Have you heard the story about the man who at Christmas time asked his neighbor what he was going to get for his wife? No. No. Well, the neighbor replied, uh, I don't know. I haven't had any offers. Here we are, Inspector. Not a very imposing-looking jail, is it? I haven't had any offers. Now, let me see. How old was I the first time I heard yeah, that? Yeah, come on, you old southwest. Don't pretend you've heard it before. Let's go in and have a talk with this constable, Finn McNutt. I haven't had any offers okay, yet. Okay, Inspector, you win. However, hey. I said... Oh, there's someone at the end of the porch. Let's go over, Inspector. It's probably Constable McNutt. That guy must be 90. Don't tell me he's the constable of this town. You fellas looking for someone? Yes. Are you Constable Finn McNutt? Huh? I can't hear you. I'm deep as a headache. Oh. I said we're looking for Constable Finn McNutt. He ain't here. Do you know when he'll be back? Who? McNutt. What do you want to see him for? I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Danton. Drake? Oh, well, why didn't you say so? My name's McNutt. Finn McNutt. Hey, come on inside. I got something to show you. Well, how do you like that, the deaf old coot? Who's a deaf old coot? Don't you call me a deaf old coot, bub. What? Well, I... I ain't old and I ain't deaf. That's what I want to be. And by the way, which one of you gents is Inspector Danton? Which one? Well, look, Gramp, if he's Drake, I must be Danton. Oh, smart guy, huh? Well, I'm going to show you fellas you ain't so smart coming up here trying to show us county constables how dumb we are. Wait a minute, we didn't... Don't talk back to me, bub. You want to work on this case, you'll do as I say. Hear me? By golly, in a minute... You hear I... me? Sure, I hear you only... All right, then. Talk when you spoke to. Not until. Now, which one of you gents is Drake? <laughs> I'm Drake, Mr. McNutt. Oh, yeah. Well, why didn't you say so? Now, look here, Drake. I've been reading about you in the newspapers. You and that other fella, what's his name, uh, Denton, Scranton, or some foreign name like that. That does it, Bart. Are you going to tell this Billy Whiskers where to hand in, or am I? Eh? What was that? You, if you got something to say, Bub, speak up. I'll speak up, all right. Now, listen, you <laughs> long-whiskered... <laughs> Let's forget personal grievances for the moment and find out about this murder. Murder? What murder? Who said there'd been a murder? I did. It was in all the newspapers. Don't you ever read the papers? You ain't a fool of me, none. I know that's why you're here. Because I sent a clipping to Drake. And who dang well he couldn't stay away. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bart, what is this? Did this joker send you a newspaper clipping? Uh, yes, he did, Inspector. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention it to you. So that's it. You dragged me way up here on a two-bit murder case and that then... That ain't why Drake come up here, bub. That ain't why at all, is it, Mr. Drake? Well, uh, no. As a matter of fact, it isn't. Uh, you bet it isn't. Um, ain't a mean... It's because I let the prisoner go, ain't it, Mr. Drake? Yes, that's it. According to all the newspaper accounts, it was pretty well established that Ed Blake had beaten his wife to death. 
And then suddenly you allowed the prisoner to go free. Frankly, I'd like to know why. I knew you'd ask me. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Well, tell us, tell us, tell us. You better tell you. I'll show you city fellas I ain't so dumb. I let Ed go because he ain't guilty, that's why. Now, that's a simple enough answer, isn't it, Bart? Hmm. Why do you think Ed isn't guilty, then? Because Marion Blake was poisoned, that's why. Poisoned? You bet she was. Look here. Here's what I wanted to show you. Hmm? Take a look at that paper. All right. Ah, I see. A medical report stating that Marion Blake died of arsenic poison. That's right. That's what killed her, all right. Arsenic poisoning. That there paper proves it. This is very interesting, Mr. McNutt, but how did you know that... Say, wait a minute. This report is signed by F.T. McNutt, M.D. Is Dr. McNutt related to you, Constable? Related? Why, well, hey, dog, go ahead. I'm him. Well, you're Dr. McNutt? Sure I am, bub. I've been a doctor for 62 years. There's my certificate right there on the wall. Don't you have much truck with it, though. My hand's too shaky lately. Folks don't have confidence in the sawbones with a shaky hand. Spend most of the time these days being constable. Well, cut off my bangs and call me Bob. How's that, Junior? Constable, I think I'm beginning to see what's behind all this. Um, being a doctor, you probably have some arsenic lying around your office. That's it, Drake. I guess you were kind of smart at that. Thank you. Last week, uh, some of that there arsenic was stole. Well, sir, the only one who's died around here in more than a year is Marion Blake. So, you put two and two together, eh? Yeah. Only in this case, two and two made five. How was that? Well, sir... I performed an autopsy, see? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, Miss Blake was dead of arsenic poisoning. How does that make two and two equal five? You keep quiet, Junior, and listen. You might learn something. The arsenic was stole one day and returned the next. During the time it was gone, Marion Blake was poisoned. So you reasoned that whoever stole the arsenic decided to return it in the hopes that you wouldn't notice its brief absence, hmm? Yeah, maybe. Hey, Drake, and Ricky, you want to know what made me suspicious in the first place, eh? Yes, yes, then I would. Well, sir, it's simple. Ed Blake wasn't in no condition to beat his wife to death, that's why. Why wasn't he? Because he was skunk drunk, that's why. Because he wasn't to home when them Santrell said they heard him beating her, that's why. He wasn't at home. Are you sure? You're dang tootin' I'm sure. Ed Blake was asleep right here in my office from six o'clock that night till midnight. <laughs> Drake, you find out who stole that arsenic and how it was given to Marion Blake, and I'll pay you $1,000 cash money. Well, this is uh, rather unusual, Constable, being offered money by the police department. It ain't being offered by the police department. No? Being offered by me, personal. As soon as folks find out the facts in this case, they're going to figure it was me that murdered Marion. Figure it was you who murdered her. Why, sure. Ed and me hated each other. Everybody knows that. He claims I killed a cow of his as I tried to doctor once. Said the critter was a purebred, and I owed him $2,000. So last week he got drunk and came over to your office and tried to collect it, hmm? Is that right, Constable? That's it. We had some words, and the folks gathered around outside. To... I ups and rest Ed for disturbing the peace. And how about it, Drake? You want that thousand bucks, or don't you? I'll take the case, Constable. But not because I think you intend paying me a thousand dollars. Frankly, my only purpose will be to satisfy my own curiosity as to why you've gone to all this trouble to tell us such a deliberate lie. Well, I declare, Mr. Drake, I don't know what Finn McNutt is talking about, I'm sure. I think he must be getting senile. So, why do you say that, Mrs. Central? Why? Well, my goodness, Mr. Drake, Walt and I ain't deaf. We know when we hear something. Then you still insist that you heard sounds of a struggle in the Blake's kitchen on the night you found her dead. Well, my land... Now, look here, Drake, of course we heard it. We've been hearing it for almost a year. What could possibly be the object in this both lying to you? That's what puzzles me. It doesn't puzzle me. Hmm? That Billy Whiskers constable was 
thinking him up as he went along. But why, Inspector? Why would he make up such a cock and bull story he knew we could check it easy enough? Yeah, that's right. And to make it worse, he's willing to pay us a thousand bucks to prove he's a liar. What? Uh. What was that you said, Inspector? I said that McNutt offered us a thousand dollars to prove him a liar. Oh, my senses. That certainly is funny. A thousand dollars. What's funny about it? Just a minute, Inspector. Mrs. Santrell... You mentioned a minute ago that Mrs. Blake called on you the morning of the murder. Yes. She said she'd come to borrow some flour, but I knew that was only an excuse. He talked about that husband of hers the whole time. Come along, Inspector. Let's go over and have a talk with Ed Blake. <laughs> Must be Ed Blake splitting wood out in his backyard. Oh, yes. Let's go over. Good afternoon. Are you Ed Blake? Yeah, that's right. Guess you two are Drake and Danton. Been expecting you. News gets around in these small towns, doesn't it? Mr. Blake, I guess uh, you know why we're here. Yeah, Ben told me. Personally, I think you're wasting your time. Marion committed suicide. Ben thinks otherwise. As long as he does, I'm willing to help out by answering your questions. What makes you say your wife committed suicide, Mr. Blake? That's a personal matter, and it's none of your business. Thought you were going to answer our question. Never mind, Inspector. I think I know the answer. Blake, if your wife had committed suicide, there'd be a box or uh, some sort of container lying nearby which held the arsenic she used. Did you uh, find any such container? I don't know. The arsenic was stolen from Finn McNutt's office, and later the unused portion was returned there. Finn says you were asleep in his office from 6 o'clock until midnight. Did uh, Finn say that? Mm-hmm. Didn't we just tell you he said it? I don't know whether you fellas are trying to trick me or not. I don't know if it makes any difference. Finn probably thought he'd help me by lying. Poor old guy. You mean you weren't in the office all the time? No. Around 7, I got up and went out to look for another bottle. Where'd you look? Not out here, if that's what you're thinking. I didn't come near this house all that day or evening. Oh, just a minute. We've got two witnesses who will swear they heard you and your wife fighting. Who are they? Walt and Martha Santrell? (laughs) They're always hearing things. Their testimony in court will carry a lot of weight, Blake. No more than my witnesses. I got witnesses who'll testify I wasn't anywhere near this house at the time a Santrell said they heard me beating up my wife. Who are they? I'll produce them when the time You'll comes. You'll produce them now unless you want to be arrested for the murder of your wife. That's so? Who's going to arrest me? I am. Not without Finn McNutt's permission. Finn's got charge of this case, and it just happens he knows I didn't murder nobody. You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Sure I am. Here comes Finn now. You can ask him if he wants you to arrest me. I'm going to ask him plenty of things. Uh, I wouldn't, Inspector. I think we're going to find that Mr. McNutt is a lot smarter than we gave him credit. Hello there. Hello, Mr. McNutt. How are you? Howdy, Drake. Hello, Ed. Hiya, Finn. Who's that there, fella? Now, (laughs) don't give us that routine again, Longbeard. You know darn well who I am. Well, dang my eyes if it ain't old gumshoe Scranton. Well, Drake... You got everything fixed up? Yes, yes, I think so, Finn. Uh, know who done it, huh? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, Finn. <laughs> I figured you would. I'm sorry I had to pull a couple of fast ones to help things along. I guess you and me uh, understand each other, though, don't we? We're beginning to, I'm sure. <laughs> you betcha. Well, let's get over to the sand trails and let them know how smart I am. <laughs> My senses, this is certainly turning into quite an affair, ain't it? Sorry we had to bother you again, Mrs. Santrell, but Finn seems to think you'd both be interested in the final outcome of the case. I don't get it. What's the idea, Finn? Oh, let Drake tell you. Me? I'm just an old hick cop that don't know nothing. You can say that again, Gramp. All right, I will. I don't know nothing. Now, Drake, you tell him, boy. All right, I'll do my best, Finn. Look, uh, Blake... Do you still insist that you weren't at your house between 6 o'clock and midnight on the night of the murder? Sure I do. And if the sand trails say any different, they're crazy. Why, the idea, the very idea. You were there, Ed Blake. We heard you. Uh, Why, we could have heard you if you'd been a mile away. Now, wait a minute. Are you sure you heard Blake, Mrs. Santrell? Or did you just hear Mrs. Blake? Just hear Marion? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Why, well, uh, I don't know what you mean. Sure we heard Ed. We both heard him. Uh, we were... Wait a minute now, Walt. Wait a minute. Uh, I think Mr. Drake's got something there. Now, just let me think. Of what do you mean, got something? We heard him, I tell you. No, no, we didn't. Yeah. I remember now. No, sir, we didn't. All we heard was Marion uh, begging Ed not to hit her. And then we heard some furniture being knocked over. Well, I declare... I don't blame you for being surprised, Mrs. Santrell. It'd be only natural for you to assume that Ed Blake was beating his wife when she kept screaming and begging him not to. Blake, tell me, did you ever strike your wife at all? Yeah. What? So? The time I found out she was seeing Walt Santrell's secret. What was that, Ed Blake? Your husband yeah. was not only carrying on a romance with Mary and Blake behind your back, Mrs. Santrell but he had ample time to administer the poison to her while he was supposed to be out caring for a sick cow. That's a lie. I didn't give her the poison. Why should I? I was in love with her. Oh, Walt, Walt. It was Ed who gave her the poison. It must have been. How could it have been? He was asleep in the constable's office all the time. No, he wasn't. Marthy went down to get Finn after we discovered Marion's body, and there wasn't anyone in Finn's office. Was there, Marthy? Was there? No. There wasn't anyone there. I got to stick by you, Walt, even though... Even though... So there wasn't anyone there, eh? Not even Gramp here. That's right, Junior. I'm in it, too. It could have been me. Could have. Had plenty of chance. I told you folks would think I did it. Well, did you? Never you mind. Go on, Drake. Needle him, boy. Needle him. Are you quite sure there was no one in the constable's office when you got there after the murder, Mrs. Andrew? Yes, I'm sure. I... I'll testify in court if necessary, if it'll prove Walt innocent. I see. That if no one were there, you had an opportunity to return the partly used box of arsenic, didn't you? What did you say? What was that? You wondered how you were going to get it back, didn't you, Mrs. Santrell? You certainly didn't want such incriminating evidence found in your possession, and you were afraid that Finn might notice the box was missing if you kept it too long. Then came a golden opportunity when you went running for the police to investigate a murder that you yourself had committed. You don't mean... You can't Oh, mean. yes, I do mean, Mrs. Santrell. Another golden opportunity came to you when Mary and Blake came over to borrow some flour. It solved a real problem, didn't it? Martha, you didn't... Say, that's an angle. By golly. You keep quiet there, Gramp. Let Drake pay it off. Go ahead, boy. You loaned Mary and Blake the flour, didn't you, Mrs. Santrell? You put arsenic in it. You knew she'd never noticed it, or that there was any likelihood of anyone guessing how the poison had been administered. Is it true, Marthy? Is it? Yes, it's true, Walt. I put the arsenic in the flour. I knew she'd make biscuits. I knew Ed was drunk and wouldn't be home. I knew about you and Marion. I, I thought you'd be over there eating supper with her. You have before. I watched you. I wanted you both to die. I wanted you both to die. And then I wanted to die myself. Take a good look at it. It says, leaving Menden. Come back and see us again. Only I'm not coming back. <laughs> You're still a little hot under the collar, Inspector? No, I'm not hot under the collar. Only these country cops get in my hair. Yeah, you'll have to admit that Finn McNutt was pretty smart, Inspector. Smart my foot. All he was was the doggondest liar I ever ran across. <laughs> Everyone in Menden seemed to do pretty well at throwing whoppers. Yeah. Imagine those Santrells cooking up that story about hearing their next-door neighbors fighting. Yeah, that wasn't a cooked-up story, Inspector. Martha Santrell actually did think Blake was beating up his wife. But Santrell knew that Mary and Blake was putting on an act, eh? Exactly. It would have provided excellent grounds for divorce, Inspector, since both Santrell and Martha would have sworn they heard the beatings, see? Ah, me. What lengths some people go to to get rid of their spouses. Yes, they certainly do, Inspector. And that's another thing I can't figure. If Constable Longbeard was so smart, what did he want us in on the case for? Why didn't he just go out and arrest Martha Santrell? But he didn't know that Martha Santrell was guilty, Inspector. He only knew that Marion Blake had died of arsenic poison. And that 
That scared him. Scared him? Yes. Remember, his job as constable was virtually honorary. And Ed Blake had already been arrested for his wife's murder. Uh, McNutt didn't want to stick his chin out, That's eh? it, Inspector. He had his pride. And he didn't want to lose his job as constable. It was his only source of income. He knew people would laugh at him if he tried to sell anyone the idea that Marion Blake had been poisoned. But he figured a couple of city cops had swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, eh? Well, he kidded us into taking the job, Inspector. He had enough evidence to prove his poisoning theory, but not enough to convict anyone. You've got to admit he was clever about it. Oh, sure, sure, I'll admit it. Good for you, Inspector. Only I'd give my badge for a chance to go back there and pull his whiskers. <laughs> I think he'd let you do it, too. He was so pleased with the way things turned out. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> he was kind of cute at that. Yeah, well, you know what he said just before we left? Well, I know he apologized to you for all the cracks he'd made. He said he tried to make us both mad so we'd stick around and pull his chestnuts out of the fire. I don't mean that. I mean... Oh, you mean when he yelled after us that from now on his new slogan was going to be Mystery is my hobby. Welcome back. I do like how everything does come together quite neatly at the end. Even my big question of why the uh, local constable uh, called for them anyway uh, was answered quite satisfactorily. Now, of course, there is the big ongoing question of the series as to why Noah Danton follows uh, Barton Drake to all of these places, you know, that are outside his jurisdiction. But that's just one of those things you just have to accept. But otherwise, I thought this was pretty solidly constructed, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, some listener comments and feedback now. Brian writes in, I'm really enjoying this new show. What a classic voice for radio. Is this the same actor that played Chuck Morgan with that horrible glamour puss line? Uh, yeah, it's Glenn Langan who starred in both series. And I will say, Mystery is My Hobby is definitely the superior history, uh, series, excuse me. Uh, Paul uh, writes in, I really enjoyed the first episode of Mystery is My Hobby. Just kept waiting for Barton Drake to call someone glamour puss. Thankfully, this show does not have that ridiculous catchphrase. Looking forward to hearing the rest of the series. Thanks for keeping us company during this time of social distancing. Well, I'm very glad to. Thanks so much for the comment, Paul. Then we have this uh, from Bill. Uh, talking now about the uh, specials we played last week. Um... Uh, uh, with uh, Pat Novak for hire, uh, Bill says, Hi, Adam, I really enjoyed this episode, especially the back and forth between Webb and Raymond uh, Burr not playing a baddie uh, for change. Uh, well, it's somewhat debatable with Hellman uh, whether he's a baddie or not, uh, but I guess more of a borderline character. Uh, Debbie says, uh, Thanks for playing this again. Pat Novak is my favorite. I love those one-liners. She was in her 30s, but pushing 40 hard enough to bruise it. Good job. And then Steve said, so this is my least favorite detective show, but I realize today that the language is fantastic. I like the similes. Well, thanks, Stephen. And I do think with Pat Novak, it's a unique show in that its appeal really is just the language and the dialogue. You know, if you look at the characters from an objective basis, they're not all that likable, although Pat does have uh, his moments. But it's the way they talk. You know, it's this really sort of uh, unique thing that takes the hard-boiled to another level that really does make this a unique show to listen to. We turn to the Apple uh, store and a review here from uh, uh, Skipper Duck in Canada writes, Love, love the stories, but can you ease up on the negative commentary? The eight to ten minutes at the end where the host dissects the story and pokes holes in everything ruins it f for me. Why can't we just enjoy the story? Well, I can appreciate where you're coming from, Skipper. Um, I don't try to be um, incredibly negative, you know, about everything. You know, there are some things, I really do, though, try to treat this like, you know, it's any other show, and to kind of build that sense of community, and we kind of talk about what was in the show, what we like, what we didn't like, 
And we get a lot of that feedback from the listeners, you know, at well as well. I try not, like I said, I try not to be too negative. If I realize that I've kind of been talking about, you know, a show negatively for about a minute, minute and a half, I'll try and uh, wrap it up. Uh, but that's, you know, kind of few and far between. Because I genuinely, you know, like all the series that I play. You know, it, I don't play anything where I absolutely hate it. Like, I'm not hate playing anything. Like, you know, if I play Danger Dr. Danfield, you know, that would be a show where I would just, you know, rip every single episode because that is the worst thing ever made in the history of anything. Though I might exaggerate just a tad. But I talk about and I dissect and, you know, we, we have back and forth with listeners because, you know, generally I like the shows and generally listeners like the shows except when they don't. But that's also fair to hear. You know, I, I think it's great to be able to discuss and talk about uh, these programs rather than just passively saying, well, they're there. Because I like to enjoy them, you know, like anything else, you know, where you talk about positives, negatives, and that's part of enjoying the show for me. I get, though, if somebody, you know, just does not like that, I would just encourage you, you know, when the story ends, just go ahead and uh, stop the program. Particularly if you can see it's going to be a long uh, commentary, because, you know, if you're using a podcatcher, you know, some sort, like I, I use the uh, Apple myself, and I can see, you know, okay, there's another 10 minutes to go in this uh, podcast. I think I'll just go ahead and stop. But thanks so much uh, for the comment, Skipper. Finally, I have an email from Alan. And for those of you who missed the news, last week there was an earthquake with an epicenter in Stanley, Idaho. It was about a 6.5 on the Richter scale. Alan emailed in to make sure that I was okay. And I am, and there was no property damage. Rocky was a little extra clingy afterwards, but that was you know, about it. Rocky, of course, being my dog. And he uh, said uh, that, I hope you talk about it at the beginning or close of an episode. I never experienced an earthquake and never talked with anyone that did. I'm glad uh, you had no damage. Well, I have to admit that more than anything else, I was... Probably the best word to be confused. I've lived in Idaho or Montana the vast majority of my life. And in either Garden City or Boise for the past 16 and a half years. Now, in both Idaho and Montana, I'd heard it stated, you know, we do live in an earthquake zone. But in all of those years, I'd never really actually felt anything. And so, out of nowhere, the house just started to shake. Now, we've had an older washer that will at times start to shake and bounce about and kind of shake like the immediate area around it. And it felt like that, only slightly more intense. And so I thought that it was something upstairs that was shaking, and I was just sitting there trying to figure out why, and it really only occurred to me towards the end of the earthquake that it actually was that. Of course, we were a good distance from uh, Stanley, which is a couple hours away. Uh, even though it didn't do much damage, it was felt pretty far away. Uh, a friend of mine who lives in my old hometown in Montana, around you know, 400 miles away from me, uh, they also felt it. And my mother said that she didn't feel it in her house, but uh, that the neighbor next door did. So it was confusing, and in the aftermath, a little unsettling. It reminded me that we do, yes, indeed, I live on an earthquake plane. I should note that this is the most intense quake we've had in Idaho in 37 years. And as far as I'm concerned, I could wait another 37 years till having another one, or more. But thank you so much for asking, Alan, and I appreciate your concern. 
I want to go ahead and thank now our Patreon of the day. Thank you to Jim. Jim's been one of our Patreon supporters since April of 2017, currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Well, that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And then next Thursday, we'll be back with another episode of Mystery is My Hobby. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.